bread and cream. This is hard to do. Go far. Okay, this is my phone. You are a patty and you get very much far from the bus. And we have to be encouraged to go overall and to come to the museum. Good job. Okay, thank you, Pam. Welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of September 27th, 2023. My name is Doug Marshall, and as the chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I am calling this meeting to order at 6.06 .06 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and is available live stream via Amherst Media. Minutes are being taken. This planning board meeting is being held in the town room at the Amherst Town Hall. However, this is a hybrid meeting Members of the planning board and members of the public are able to attend via Zoom. Pursuant to chapter 20 of the acts of 2021 and extended by chapter 22 of the acts of 2022 and extended again by the state legislature on July 16th, 2022, the planning board has been given authority to hold meetings via Zoom. The Zoom meeting link is available on the meeting agenda posted on the town website's calendar listing for this meeting, or you can go to the planning board's webpage and click on the most recent agenda, which has the Zoom link at the top of the page. Please be aware that the in-person meeting will not be suspended or terminated if technological problems interrupt the virtual meeting, unless otherwise required by law. Every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the meeting in real time via technological means. In the event we are unable to do so for reasons of economic hardship or despite best efforts, we will post an audio or video recording, transcript or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting on the Town of Amherst website. Board members, I will take a roll call. When I call your name, please answer affirmatively whether you are participating uh, remotely or in person. So we know that Bruce Coldham is absent this evening. Fred Hartwell. Present. He said present. Jesse Major, present. Hi, Doug Marshall, I'm present. Janet McGowan. Here. And I'll note that everyone who's answered thus far is uh, participating in person. And Johanna Newman. Here. And finally, Karen Winter, can you speak? Uh, I know you are participating remotely. Here. Thank you, Karen. Okay, so six members are present, one is absent this evening. For those participating remotely, please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your request, hopefully, if I look up and I can actually see what's going on on that screen. And I will see your request and call on you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute yourself. Pam, if you're able to keep an eye on the screen and alert me to Karen's hand raised, that'd be great. Planning mem board members who are present in the town room should also raise their physical hands when they wish to speak and the microphone will be passed to you. We have two microphones at the table this evening, one at each end. The general public comment item is reserved for public comment regarding items not on tonight's agenda. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during general public comment period. Public comment may also be heard at other times during the meeting when deemed appropriate by the chair. Please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited if you are participating remotely or raise your hand if you are present in the town room. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your phone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. 
Residents can express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with the guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation may be discontinued from the meeting. Okay, so the time now is 610 and we'll go ahead and go into our first item, which is public comment period. Do we have, actually usually at this time, I do re, uh, read the names of the people who are present uh, participating as public. Here in the town room, I believe there's only one member of the public and that is Pam Rooney. Um, the other members who are participating remotely, uh, I see the name David Zomek, Lily Bruce and Mara Keen. So we have a pretty small public uh, presence this evening, but uh, maybe, yes, Chris. Dave Zomek is uh, in attendance as an uh, attendee, but he asked to be let in as a panelist. He's the assistant town manager, and director of conservation and development. And I wondered if you would um, ask Pam to let him in as a panelist, please. Certainly, Pam, could you do that? <laughs> Thank you, Chris. So we're down to three members of the public. Okay. So do any members of the public want to make a comment on something that is not on tonight's agenda this evening? Okay. Um, I don't see any members of the public on our Zoom call raising their hands. Actually, yeah. Yeah, so no, um, I do see one hand from Pam Rooney, who's here in the town room. If you could, as a citizen, if you could come and grab a microphone and make your one less than three minute comment on something not on tonight's agenda. Hi, thank you. I had a question about the uh, RFP for the design guidelines and just wondered what the status of that project is and um, when it might be coming out in the public. Thank you. So typically we don't respond to comment. Is, are we, do you wanna to respond to that, Chris? I would like to respond to it only because it's a question that's come up before. And we have sent our RFP to accounting to the person who does um, the requisitions and, and uh, seeks input from the, you know, bidding. That's the word I'm looking for. In any event, um, I think she's been backed up, but it is down in accounting as we speak. So I'm hoping that she puts it out in the next few days or the next week or so. But we've finished with it in plan. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Pam. Um, Nate, uh, we can't see you, but hopefully we can hear you if you unmute. Mm -hmm. Do you want to add to that? Oh, sure. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, no, the the request for proposal will go live on Monday and be due at the end of October. So uh, that's something that, you know, is it's all set. And then, uh, you know, once it's public, anyone can be referred to the link on the town's bid posting web page. Okay, thank you, Nate. Okay, so we're now up to 614. I believe we're done with public comment period. Now we can talk about planning for housing growth. And I guess I'd like to say at the beginning, it's this this meeting has, in most of the meetings we've had with the board and it, including the board that preceded the current makeup of the board, we were, we've been kind of talking about how could zoning be changed in order to allow more housing. And I think that, uh, I mean, I, I guess at the last meeting, I was kind of asked to say whether I thought we were reconsidering the sort of duplex and tri triplex uh, proposal that had come from a couple of town councilors. And I think I said that I didn't think we were gonna revisit that, that we were headed in a probably in a lar larger scale dimension or direction uh, for trying to allow some larger scale housing to happen in certain parts of town, wherever that ended up happening. So that's how I felt about it. And there wasn't a lot of conversation about that last week, but I, if there's people who really don't want to go in that direction, I would hope counselor or 
board members would say that um, at some point, because otherwise that's where I think we're going. So I just wanted to put that on the record. Um, so I was, I was pleased. I mean, at, at our last meeting two weeks ago, we all got a preview of these maps that uh, maybe Nate and Chris and the planning board staff put together with, you know, their thoughts about three different areas that the board has talked about uh, where we might change the zoning in some way. One was East Amherst Village, uh, one was University Drive, and one was, I think, North, Pres North Pleasant Street, kind of from Kendrick Park up to the university. So, um, Chris uh, or Nate, are there any introduction to these maps that you want to give us? Um, Jesse, uh, I see your hand. I, what, what would you, what would you like to say before maybe Chris has an intro? Yeah, thanks. I just want to make a comment before we dive into the maps, and um, this kind of came up last meeting. I had sent an email, but I think it lost in the shuffle. Definitely relates to the some of the goals Janet laid out here and the goals I understand in the master plan, what we're trying to do. I don't want to derail this conversation, but I think if our goals are to preserve neighborhood vitality, integrity, the look, all the things we've been talking about, some of the things on Bruce's charts there, we have to consider some kind of regulation as well moving forward. So I hope that can be a conversation at a future meeting, meaning regulation around rentals. And in order to do that, I feel like we have to have the data. So I'm not aware that we have data by neighborhood how many rentals there are. So that feels essential in order to have a productive plan, right? Um, we can rezone to allow more density, but I'm not sure that's going to help us maintain the character of our neighborhoods. As we know, there's a need for a lot more student housing, at least. Building more without getting a handle on what's currently happening also won't at all help with increasing workforce portability for our town. Right? So I just wanted to make that comment. Again, I hope we as a group can discuss this at a future. So regulation, when you say regulation, are you meaning zoning regulation or other regulation? I'm sure. Whatever Is context that takes, I feel like those are tools the planning board must okay. be able to use in some way for long-term plan. Okay. Well, the the only thing I wanted to maybe, maybe get some clear word. maybe, maybe really well but, but 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 there has been conversation before about what is our area of what are the tools that this board has to affect what the town is like. And my primary my understanding is that the primary tool we have is the zoning bylaw. And if it's not a zoning regulation, if it's a different sort of bylaw then that's some other group in town. I mean, it's probably town council eventually, but. Right. So I guess I'm struggling to see how we can make intelligent planning without that piece of it uh -huh. from us or from town council or from CRC. I don't know. Okay. It okay. It's like it has to be part of the conversation. Thanks, Jesse. Janet. Hey, when you talk, could you talk? Oh, Jesse, yes, you I'll talk? hold it closer. Because when I was listening to the meeting, I, d I could hardly hear you. So. Um, so I've kind of missed a few meetings, and so I prepared this sheet because I was just writing notes, and I thought, well, you know, because I've gone to some of them, and I just thought I'd put it together what I heard, and I threw a few of my ideas in, but I don't think that the planning board is limited to just zoning recommendations, and so I went back and looked at my chapter 41, section 81C, um, studies and reports of the board. Um, it says the planning board established under section blah, blah, blah shall from time to time make careful studies and when necessary prepare plans of the resources, possibilities and needs of the city or town. And upon completion of the study shall submit to the city council or selectmen a report thereon. And so, and then under section 71, we're supposed to do an annual report to the city council, giving information regarding the condition of the town and plans or proposals for its development and estimates, estimates of the co cost thereof. So I think we have a much broader mandate. We don't have to only limit to zoning regulations. And I agree with Jesse that, you know, we can upzone, you know, half all the village centers, and that's not going to help the neighborhoods. Um, and I think that the RG is kind of an endangered, critically endangered. We we sit here year after year hearing about, you know, student rentals, overwhelming neighborhoods, 
And, you know, so I was thinking like it's a seesaw. So if we're going to upzone the village centers, I would say let's reduce the density in the RG and RN because, you know, the RG is now seven units an acre. No homeowner is going to say, oh, I think I'll build six units and be a landlord so I can stay in the RG. Maybe one unit, maybe two. The people who are going to build that are going to be developers and they're going to aim at the market where they can get the most money, especially since it's really expensive to build. And so ERG is zoned for being turned into a series of apartment complexes or duplex complexes, and we're going to lose it as a neighborhood. And um, so I think, you know, we could recommend down zoning the RG, but we also have to deal with the recommendations that other towns have used or cities very successfully. And so we could recommend to the town council the minimum distance, you know, limiting the percentage of, you know, you know, say no more than 50% of the units can go to students or whatever. And we can't pass that, we can't pass anything, but we can make recommendations after capital study saying this has worked. Or we could recommend to the town council to please implore UMass to build 3000 more beds because until that happens, we're just, we're just filling, we're, we're turning into a dorm. Our neighborhoods are turning into dorms and that doesn't affect me personally, but I listen to people all the time where it really has affected them. Okay, Fred. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as someone who came on the board at the beginning of July, and I was not part of any making a, a conclusion that uh, uh, we weren't in going to want to look at the existing bylaw and where it could be changed and how it should be changed to meet a, a broader objective. Uh, in general, my experience going back to the first time I was on the board and chaired the zoning subcommittee, my experience has been that any zoning decision has to be, has to take into account a whole bunch of trade-offs. Uh, it's they're never simple. Um, if you only accomplish one thing, uh, one one public policy objective, it's probably a bad zoning decision because it didn't weigh trade-offs. And so I I am interested in the in the broader picture of the bylaw uh, at our at our next meeting. It looks like I uh, will be taking some time to discuss the question of owner occupancy, but there, there are a lot of pieces to this and uh, I am not comfortable saying that we're only going to talk about the, the overlay. Okay, thank you, Fred. Jesse? Just one more comment. What resources do we have to gather data? Really just a question. So I have the, the staff, the town staff is our primary resource for data and generating okay. materials. Right. And so how does that work if, if we decide we would like data on how many rentals there are, do we have the resources to gather that? Chris. So we can do some data gathering. Um, we, uh, as you know, have limited um, staff right now. And um, even after we hire a new person, we're still going to have limited staff. So you can tell us what you want and we can try to get the information. Um, the Donahue Institute has a lot of information and other groups have information. And Nate is actually quite good at getting that information, but it, it, we need to um, just be mindful of the fact that the planning board is, planning department is down one person. And um, so we're doing our best. So let us know what you want to know and we'll see if we can find it, find it out. But I would like to say, in response to um, some of the things that have been brought up just now. And by the way, I don't have an introduction. Perhaps Nate has some sort of introduction because he developed these maps. But I wanted to say that one of the ways of protecting neighborhoods, I think, is to create housing in other locations that are more suitable for student housing. And that will, um, we hope, draw students out of the neighborhoods. And so if you provide good, affordable housing in, um, on you know in this East Amherst Village Center on, on University Drive 
or on um, North Pleasant Street, those are the places that we've chosen to focus on tonight that can help to alleviate some of the pressure on the neighborhoods. So that's that's the idea here. Okay. So Janet, I know you put together a, a handout and I think Karen had put together, actually that's, a, that's, that's our second agenda item. Um, so did you wanna talk about your handout at all or was this just stuff for people to read and think about? Um, thank you. Um, basically, this is not my ideas. I, I stuck in two ideas I think I brought up before, maybe in March, but this was just what people were saying at this past meeting that I didn't attend. And then I cribbed a bunch of stuff off of notes from the March meeting, the the minute. So I was just, I did, I did it, I was just doing it to take notes and I thought, this would be a good exercise for us not to lose ideas, you know, because there's so many ideas. And I tried to put them in kind of little buckets, like, you know, when I listed the goals I heard people mention, um, one was to produce more workforce, family, and senior housing in Amherst. Another goal was to preserve neighborhood vitality and integrity. One was to control and mitigate the negative impacts of student housing in neighborhoods. Another goal was to produce quality, affordable housing for students, because I know students have trouble affording even on-campus dorms. Keep Amherst, another goal is keep Amherst attractive and to preserve its look and small town feel. And so then those were things I heard people say, one of our goals is, and I just love that because it keeps us focused. And then I just, I just created different buckets based on what people were saying. And so one was, um, work with UMass on student housing problems because it seems inconceivable that we'll ever figure that out without talking to people who deal with it all the time. Um, create a designated student housing zones. And there's just a lot of, uh, people have just, it's very rich. Um, the first three were you know, strategies to reduce the number of student rentals in neighborhoods and a lot of ideas for that. Rezoning to increase density and height in um, village centers. A lot, a lot of conversation about East Amherst that seemed very rich, um, other places for housing, um, things like that. So I just, I was basically, basically capturing what I heard at the meetings and from the minutes. So I thought this could be helpful. So we don't, I don't know if we can do things section by section. Like today, it sounds like we're going to talk about village centers. And so maybe we could focus on the other parts at different meetings. Okay, thank you, Janet. Karen, I see your hand. Uh... Uh, yeah, I think, you know, there's some urgency involved in, in moving ahead. And I I like the idea of, of finding areas where a lot of housing could be added as quickly as possible. Um, I like the, the three places that the staff has suggested, but I'm wondering why did you leave out uh, the Olympia drive area is that not town property is it university property because that seems like to me a, a really wonderful place to concentrate a, an awful lot of student housing uh that's that's needed chris i see your hand i think that we agree that olympia drive is the best is one of the best places for student housing but the university controls all of that land the two parcels that were available for development have been purchased by Archipelago Investments. They've built one Olympia Place up there already, and they have permission from the planning board to build another um, dormitory, what do they call it, apartment-style dormitory up there. But those are really the only parcels that are available to be developed other than UMass land, and, and we don't really have control over UMass. So the, that that kind of underlines why the planning board should have a little bit more contact with UMass. I know we can't negotiate, but we certainly can have a little bit more information. What is their plan? How fast are they going to move? Um, you know, their reputation right now is not good. The students are really angry because of the fact that they have so uh, little options in housing. And I would think that the university would want to be really um, ready to move on that quickly because they stand to profit a lot if if they do a lot to have to have an enhanced 
student village there. I, I foresee a wonderful broad bicycle path, which would go across to the west through their land, uh, where the Frisbee Park is now directly to the university. There could be space for kind of a north village, which was uh, so popular that that populated our our schools with wonderful international students and eager parents. So I would think it, hand in hand with the university, we should really put a little bit of a burner under that if we can't, I, or or ask Paul Bachelman to really get on it since he's the one that's negotiating for us. Uh, that's so, but I understand why you le left that off. And otherwise of the three parcels, uh, I, I would be in favor of really concentrating a lot on the university drive because I see that if we have public outreach, I, I don't see there would be so much um, um, of a problem in disturbing neighborhoods there or feel, people feeling pressured. Uh, and I like very much what Doug Marshall suggested as a vision at the last meeting where he said, could we conceive of a broad, of, of our saying, we wanna make a broad boulevard to the university, tree-lined and expansive sidewalks for bicycles and transportation and work hand in hand to have that be continued. That's that's the parcel that I see that we could move ahead on um, with the most urgency, in my opinion. Okay, thanks, Karen. Uh, and we will in our, Second item on the agenda tonight, talk about the conversation with UMass. Uh, Chris, I see your hand. So one of the reasons that um, two out of these three areas are really important, um, especially in terms of UMass, is that they abut UMass land. The University Drive parcel or parcels um, just to the north of them uh, is a vast area of UMass land that UMass might be encouraged to develop for housing. Um, but the town could make it easier for private developers to develop property along University Drive, which may, in fact, encourage UMass. If the town is encouraging private developers to develop there, UMass might feel that, oh, yes, this could become, um, you know, one big area for student housing. The other area is North Pleasant Street, which abuts um, University. And if some of that land were... Um, made it a little bit more uh, flexible in terms of being able to develop. That also could spur the university on to develop that portion of their campus. So um, those two areas, I think, are really important to look at. And especially when we have this conversation coming up with um, two representatives, maybe three representatives, if we're lucky, of the university on October 25th, I think that it would be worthwhile to talk about those two areas in particular. And of course, East Amherst is one that we've been talking about a lot among ourselves. So I guess that's all I have to say right now. Okay, thanks, Chris. Jesse? One more uh, comment and observation relevant to our upcoming conversation. So the new development on Lincoln and Mass Ave that just opened, Fieldstone Slate, it's pretty clear that the the rents there are quite a lot more than house, houses, student rental houses. And so until, so if that's the kind of development we're thinking of encouraging, that's not gonna take pressure off the neighborhood houses until there's way more than needed, which is far off. So I don't know how much influence we, what tools we have to influence rents, probably none, but that seems like it has to be part of the conversation and thinking about what's gonna get built also. And that to me is why gathering the data and trying to influence neighborhood stuff is also has to go hand in hand. Okay, I had seen Fred's hand next. Um, I agree that the uh, uh, indicated area on University Drive is comparatively low hanging fruit. Um, I just wanna take this opportunity to point out this is a classic example of a potential zoning decision that uh, involves some serious trade-offs. And I say this because as long as I've been active in Amherst Town government, which goes back many, many decades, we have a real systemic 
problem in Amherst that we've never really been able to address, and that is the fact that the tax base is overwhelmingly residential. Uh, a place like Northampton, with a somewhat smaller population, has a huge percentage of their tax base in commercial and industrial. We don't have that. And it causes no end of problems. University Drive is one of the few places besides the center of town, which is squarely focused on commercial development. And if this goes over into student housing, and I, th I think, yeah, there's, a, there's certainly a place for some of this housing there, but let's be careful, very careful about, uh, again, trade-offs. They're, they're, they're not obvious, but they're here. Thank you, Fred. I guess that might suggest that a mixed use building sort of typology in the University Drive area might be more appropriate, requiring commercial space on the first floor and some amount of residential above it. Um, Janet was next, and then we'll get to Chris. So, Chris, so I don't think we can focus on three areas and, and focus. But I, I, I think we should do, I mean, I, I would love to talk about East Amherst Village Center. I think University Drive is a great spot. I think what's not a great spot is North Pleasant Street. I think um, many years ago, Doug, you said, where can we build housing where it's not going to incite a buzzsaw of dissent? And I think, you know, this neighborhood, you know, kind of sandwiched between Amherst Center and the university is coming to us again and again saying, we're overcome by students, we're losing all sorts of family housing, entire streets you know, have converted since I've been here to all student housing. And then we're saying, well, let's build some more across from Kendrick Park and lead into the gateway. And I, I do think UMass should use those spots. I think it'd be great for graduate student housing, family housing, prof young professors housing, you know, perhaps undergraduates, and that's their land, and they, they should do that. But I think if you're gonna put a whole series of three, four, five-story buildings across from Kendrick Park, fill them with students, you know, it. I think it's gonna, first of all, I think it's gonna, you know, it's it's gonna, that area is being considered for historic district. Um, I think it's gonna create tremendous opposition. It's gonna sound like the planning board is not listening to people. And it's going to push more people into houses because, you know, a, a studio for $2,000 is much more expensive than renting a room for $850. And it would push people to be not just four people in a, a Victorian apartment. It might push you to six. And I, I've talked to students, and one of the reasons they live off campus is it's cheaper, and they don't have to go into the meal plan, and it's cheaper for them to cook at home. And I've seen the conditions in those apartments, and they're not pretty. And so I think, in a weird way, that would create more pressure. And I think, you know, we're already putting 800 students on the edge of that neighborhood. Let's not put another 800, 1,000. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense. But also, I think it's going to get huge opposition, and we're going to just, it's not going to go anywhere. So let's focus on University Drive, East Amherst Center, which is East Amherst Center's cooking. And so it'd be great to be able to put some design ideas or some zoning changes that make sure that what's there is something we, that's going to improve that neighborhood that's very vital to begin with. J Janet, I'm not sure what you mean that the high rents of the new project are going to, or any new construction would push people into houses. What do you mean by that? Because increasing the supply seems to me to be a generally a good thing you know, of any sort in order to uh, provide more opportunities and more supply to this pretty high demand that we have. So so basically my from what I've heard from people in red is that you know when you're renting a room in a house it's between like 850 to $1000 per bed and so that's cheaper than paying $1600 for a bed or 2000 and so building expensive student housing next to UMass isn't necessarily going to alleviate it. 
the, you think you think oh we built we just built a thousand units of housing and the prices everywhere have gone up. Um, one of the things I passed around was the UMass how they've increased their um, it's only into 2021 I think it's even more now, and so we have like 8,000 students that don't have housing, and then we you know so I I think that I mean I think that's a phenomenon that you know these most people who can't afford these expensive apartments are looking in town for cheaper rates. People who can't afford a thousand dollars a month for a dorm room plus the meal plan are being pushed into town. So you're suggesting that the town shouldn't build any more housing because it'll push people into houses. I think there's a dynamic going on. That's sort of what Fred is saying. It's complicated. So we just built a thousand units of housing and prices have gone up. Right, so we can build two thousand more units of housing at some hope that it prices are going to go down, but I think that hasn't been happening, and so we have to be careful about where we place the housing and putting a ton of students near Amherst Center around these two very sensitive neighborhoods under pressure isn't going to alleviate the pressure on them unless you do the things that Bruce is saying, which is reducing the amount of students student rentals or the percentage of students on a street. I mean, there has to, it has to be sort of a seesaw. You know, you can, we can pack students along North Pleasant Street, and then we're gonna wind up packing the RG because it's just gonna keep going on. I don't see how it's gonna alleviate the pressure unless we say the neighborhoods can, or can only take a percentage of housing of students. Okay. Um, Chris, I think your hand was next and then Jesse. I just wanted to mention the fact that these new buildings that people may not be so fond of do pay a lot in taxes. And so although we may not have, you know, industry and um, perhaps as much, you know, R&D as we would like, the, the new buildings pay hundreds of thousands of dollars in taxes and really keep our schools going and keep us from having to lay off town employees, of which I'm one. Um, but I want just want everybody to keep that in mind. Thanks. So you didn't declare a conflict of interest before this conversation, did you? <laughs> Jesse, go ahead. Just to add to that conversation, I was trying to comment on this before. Naive understanding, until supply of housing is more than demand, pressure is not going to decrease. And that's why I think it has to go, yes, we should encourage more building in places we want it, focus for students, and we have to try and get up handle on the neighborhood rentals as well to, to reduce the pressure in, intentionally. Because if we just let it go, the pressure is not going to change until 8,000 more beds are built, which is 15 years away, right? So I think that's similar to what you're saying, Janet. Okay, thanks, Jesse. Fred. Um, I, this, I think, is directed at Chris. Uh, it's The idea has been floated several times about some somehow reducing the density of students in a neighborhood and so many student rental apartments and for the life of me i i i cannot figure out how you could uh create that to happen legally i'm just thinking of my own street uh, i have two apartments Currently, they're rented to students. Often, they're not. But um, okay, um, how do we, uh, you know, how, how do I uh, assume that I can go on renting them? If, if you know, how, how do you how do you do the how do, do you have a lottery or something? I mean, how do you? It, it, it's, Fred, Fred, are you asking how could we? tell a landlord you can no longer rent to students yeah uh, uh, so because that that what's been floated here is various formulas to reduce the density of quote unquote student housing and legally i don't know exactly how you enforceably define that without uh i can think of lots of problems with the law in terms of attempting to discern that information in, in specific cases. And uh, 
how how it would work. In Fred, fact, I mean, I guess I the way I imagine it would happen is you'd put together some set of regulations with limits on number of students and distance between houses that are rented to students or something. And anybody who is currently renting to students would be grandfathered. And it would simply prevent the situation from getting worse in that we're in that nobody additional could be showing up with a house that's been owner occupied. So, so this would be through the rental registration process and not the zone. Probably. Process. I mean, I, I mean, think that's earlier you could yeah, you could get I mean, there earlier this year, there was conversation about uh, putting some sort of distance and density uh, limits on rentals to students into the zoning bylaw. And we never really pursued that. Um, but, you know, we could come back around to that if that's where the board wants to go. Jesse. I also, I did find examples, a few municipalities that had legally defined student housing. And, Zones. And, well, no, uh, they had some kind of definitions which held up in their bylaws to say this is a student rental and it had to do with square footage per bed. There are a bunch of different metrics, mm. but they really were able to classify units essentially as student versus not. And that really piqued my interest as something we should pursue again okay. in this later conversation, maybe. Okay. Karen, I see your hand. Um, yeah, I, I thank you, uh, Fred, for bringing up those those cautionary things of developing University Drive. I want to zero in on it again because I think there's really an urgency not only to discuss things like limiting student housing in town, which is which is really urgent because the town is being destroyed as we speak with more and more houses gone from the family market going to the student market, but also because there's such a, a need for for uh, student houses. So the University Drive, yes, it is a prime place where um, business commercial space could be um, needed and, and, and would go, but I, I think that you could really do both. We would need a really good professional planner that would make this kind of boulevard to the university have large, there's there's the land is there, large complexes where students can live. And remember when undergraduates are together, it also becomes loud and there has to be some monitoring. Um, and it would be a prime place for certain kinds of com commercial uh, businesses, certainly more restaurants that are needed maybe laundry mats, who, who knows what kind of businesses could go in there. Um, but I think we should zero in on, on what we could do in this area to, to move forward. All right, thanks, Karen. I wanna comment on one thing you said, which was that when there's a lot of students together, they get loud. And my perception of the new large buildings downtown, 11, Pleasant, 11 North Pleasant and the Kendrick Place building is that they're very quiet. Uh, no? Please, that seems to one, be one, of our, one of our public, public uh, attendees disagrees that Ken, Kendrick Place is loud. Kendrick Place is loud, okay. Okay, all right, so we have a neighbor in the room who disagrees. So my perception walking by a few times a week is probably is not completely accurate. But maybe okay. loud and commercial goes together. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you, Karen. Uh, Janet. Um, it, I'd like just in terms of University Drive, I think that apartment buildings are taxed at a commercial, they're considered commercial buildings. But when you go down University Drive, you know, there's that little low set of buildings with the bike store and a pizza place. And, you know, it looks, and then there's that, you know, there's an office building. And then there's, and there's a lot of really low buildings there that seem to me that could be developed further and be bigger. Um, you know, the big Y, you know, I think that could be a place for more housing, actually, because especially since that night, their, um, you know, their parking lots aren't really being used. And I've seen more and more housing going in around strip development. Um, it's a great spot if you, I mean, there's so many things going on there and there's so many transportation things that 
you know, I don't know if it has to be a student housing area, but it'd be a great, you could walk to the grocery store, you could walk to the urgent care for your broken leg, you could get your blood taken, you can visit your relatives in a nursing home or assisted living. You know, there's there's a ton of businesses there, but I feel like it could be more. And if there are more people living near there, it would get more vital. And I, th I think if you go up, I know there's a lot of wetlands there, but even, there's a lot of buildings that are just kind of low um, buildings that look like they could be bigger. Uh, Chris, why don't you go now? I just wanted to say that the whole area there is zoned BL, limited business. Um, there's a little piece of it that's zoned OP, which is uh, office park. But the limited business area is really limited as far as the number of dwelling units that you can put in there. So if we were to change that to something other than limited business, or if we were to come up with some sort of overlay zone that we could put on that whole area that would allow more housing to be built. I think you would find that those properties could be developed and they would be developed you know, nicely and well, and there's room for parking. And there, as you said, there's transportation. So I think it's a really great place to encourage development. Yeah, I, I lived in Amity Place when I first moved to town and I could do everything I needed to do without a car. I could walk to the grocery store. I could ride my bike down to UMass to work. I could go to the eye doctor. I could do everything. You know, I forgot to bring my zoning bylaw and look this up, but does business village center solve all our problems? Like what can you do there? Um, <laughs> I mean, I forgot to look this up before I, but you know, is, I mean, you know, I'm looking for a zoning that's flexible with that, is... Chris, do you want to? Well, I just wanted to give you an example. Um, Mr. McChee has Nate's got his hand up. Oh, too. And, and Nate, yeah. I, um, Mr. McChee has developed the um, property on Southeast Street as a three-story uh, mixed-use building. I don't think he's had success yet in getting tenants for the ground floor, but he's proposing something across the street, and I think what he's proposing across the street is taller. But in any event, those are in the BVC zoning district and, you know, have been allowed to develop be developed there, or at least the one that's built um, based on the BVC zoning. So I think it's a good zoning district for, um, for mixed use buildings, but there may be some limitations on it that we don't want to have, and I haven't studied it enough, but Rob Mara thinks it may be more beneficial to create an overlay zone that would eliminate whatever problems there are with the BBC. And as I said, I haven't studied it well enough to know what those are. Okay. Nate, I see your hand. Sure. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, my idea for the university drive area is an overlay that is more creative than BBC or any of the zoning district we have. Right. So I think my, I, personally, I think we could have a thousand new beds down there for students and we call it student housing overlay. And we get creative in terms of setbacks and building design and streetscape design that really isn't encompassed in the zoning bylaw right now. And so, you know, the downtown design standards would kind of pick up on some of this, but I think to tackle the housing problem, we have to be a little bit more creative. And so I think an overlay is something that I would be encouraging and something more than just, you know, a building here, a building there. Like, let's look at this whole area and say, okay, how can we make it look nice and also maximize the number of beds only for students. Let's call it student housing. And that's, it's a student housing overlay. And then the other areas in town, East Amherst, what other village centers, you know, we could have some other types of zoning overlay or different standards. Um, because I do think the student housing market is so strong that most of the stuff we're going to build is going to be students. And so it is difficult to control price and market. Um, so, so Nate, um, when I've thought about this, the student overlay, um, I've almost felt the opposite, like the new overlays we should do to allow as much flexibility in the housing that gets built as possible. And then there are some, some areas where we'd want to do an overlay where we explicitly prohibit students. Like did University Drive, I, as a working professional, could find that a really great place to live. Why would we prevent people from building housing that I could live in, in that location? There's not a neighborhood really that, that would object to having students there, but why limit it to students? 
Okay. Maybe not, but I do think, for instance, like Aspen Heights, um, you know, provided affordable units. And I actually think that that type of development, it'd probably be best not to have any affordable units there, right? We've I've heard it from a few different people that some of the units remain vacant because it's really not, um, you know, as nice of a place in terms of a community setting. And so, you know, some of my other ideas would be in other parts of town, we could tweak our inclusionary zoning bylaw we could change our definitions of apartment to change the different types of unit sizes and do other things to encourage more than just, you know, studios and ones or whatever the market is kind of putting out there now at the highest rent. Um, you know, right. well, maybe it so doesn't have to be students only for this overlay, but I'd like to think creatively about, right, how can we maximize density? Um, and maybe it doesn't have to be, you know, if we want to have affordable units, I think we have to change our, our, our uh, inclusionary zoning and have it be a bigger percentage and also maybe up to, you know, 150% AMI or something mm -hmm. so that we get a better mix of, of people in the, in the units. Well, if we, if we use the, the unit mix to sort of skew one way or the other in terms of towards students or away from students, it seems like the, like the units in 11 East Pleasant street are four bedrooms with maybe four bathrooms or two bathrooms and they're laid out pretty much like they're, they're laid out for students. They're not laid out for, for a family. Whereas, so if you had a, like on University Drive, if you didn't have a lot of restrictions on the unit mix and types, you would probably get, because the demand is there, a predominance of buildings that were geared towards students, but you might get a couple of buildings that were not geared towards students in recognition that there's probably a market there too. Whereas, say up on North Pleasant Street, you might explicitly say, you know, you couldn't have anything larger than a two bedroom unit. In which case, those are gonna be units that are more, you know, more likely to be rented by, uh, you know, young families or working professionals that wanna live in an apartment for some number of years, maybe before buying a house or whatever. and but those won't have quite the same density economies of scale that uh, that students would put up with. So that would be skewed more toward, away from students. And then um, down in East Pleasant Street um, or East, East Amherst Village, you know, we could allow a variety of unit types. Yes, there's a lot of students down there, the more students are there, the more PVTA is, is going to need to up their bus service. And just in terms of the geography, the less, you know, if I'm a student and I have a, an option of a, of a unit near campus or a unit afar from campus, I assume I'm going to prefer the one near campus if I can, you know, maybe it allows me not to have a car. I mean, I, I mean, so I think there's slightly different you know, maybe East, Am East Amherst, maybe that ought to be skewed toward families and working, you know, more affordable housing. And downtown, you know, has its own demand profile. And we do it through units uh, is kind of what I'm wondering. Yeah, but I, I just quickly, I think that even if we have, you know, rezone East Amherst and University Drive, East Amherst is just going to be filled with students because the demand is so high. And so I think if we don't want East Amherst to be filled with students, I think we could, we need to do a few different things. Like I think okay. our inclusionary zoning could go up to 20% of units and instead of 12% right now, we could say that that additional 8% uh, is at up to 150% AMI for any project over a certain number of units or something. Okay. And that way All right. we're kind of yeah. mandating a range of incomes. Okay. I mean, and that sounds plausible to me, uh, Janet and then Karen. So I, I have to just say, Nate, and I'm sorry to say this, I hate the idea of an overlay to solve underlying zoning problems. Like to me, East Amherst Village Center, and I understand how it got to be zoned that way, but I think to me, it you know, adding an overlay to a really complicated kind of messed up zoning district just to me seems like avoiding a problem and creating more complexity. And so I would love to see like, to do like a experiment, like what if we turn that into BBC? And then you could say, okay, here are the problems with BBC. 
you know, we need more, we, it gives you more flexibility, but it has these limitations. And so maybe we have the East Amherst BVC and we loosen up the criteria for, you know, the classic thing. And so I think, you know, and then in terms of university drive, I think, you know, it is a logical place to put students and we might say, okay, this is a student housing zone, but we want to give flexibility that young professionals or university staff also can live there too. So, I, you know, but I think to leave the BL sitting on the university drive constraining regular development doesn't make sense to me. I think we should just, I think we have to go area by area and zone for that area. Um, and, you know, we do have the tools in our kit, but maybe, you know, we have a BVC on university drive, but you can go to four stories or, you know, whatever. Nate, I see your hand. I'm assuming you want to respond to Janet and then we'll go to Karen. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, I, so the only place I really mentioned an overlay was university drive. I, I think the other maps in my mind for East Amherst is that's the geographic extent of where we could look at. Do we rezone base zoning? Do we have an overlay? What are the techniques there? So I agree with East Amherst. I think BBC could solve a lot. I think we might want to throw in a footnote A and make right. You said maybe some minor changes. So I'm not proposing necessarily an overlay in East Amherst. That was just a map showing if we're rezoning, what's the extent of possible rezoning, right? What what is maybe some areas we consider? And so, really, I you know, and I agree. I think that there's these three areas are almost too much to do at once. And so, um, so I was really talking about an overlay on University Drive, not anywhere else. You know, not the other maps. Just okay, to, great. Karen, we're finally to you. Yeah, I like I like Nate's plan of uh, having an overall plan for University to Drive and not doing it piecemeal uh, and bringing in really good people and also really doing this hand in hand with the university and having great expectations of how they would continue it because they really need to step up. Their reputation is on the line. They need to have this student housing. Um, and I, one thing that does worry me is on University Drive, isn't there that that senior home, Elaine's? Um, there, so we do have the Arbors. Have, the Arbors is down there. The Arbors, the Arbors. Yep. So uh, that's why we need a big plan. Student overlay, I like the idea, but where does it go? That's a long lane, and uh, there could be an awful lot fit in there if it's properly done. If we do it piecemeal, um, it will, I don't know. It, it, I, I like the idea of, of really zeroing in on saying, this is what we need. This is where it could be. And yes, uh, Doug, I also like the idea of being an older person and wanting to live there too in an apartment if it's nicely done and it has a chance de lise kind of feeling to the university, <laughs> you know? But I think uh, creative planning can can we can really brainstorm and see what would be the best possible solution for this this avenue all right thanks karen and janet i see your hand chris are you do you want to respond to that or do you if you have okay go ahead and respond and then we'll move to, to janet so i just wanted to point out that the town has some degree of control over things but not over everything so the town can open the door to certain things via zoning, and that allows private developers to make choices and decisions about their own property and develop them in the way that they think is best. But we can't force anyone to develop a property in a certain way or tell them that they have to develop it in a certain way. The other thing is we have control over the infrastructure. So we have control over the roadway, whatever is within the town right of way, the town can make determinations about what it wants to do there. But I don't want us to get off and think that we we can make a plan for exactly what we want University Drive to be, and then think that plan is going to come to fruition. Like I said, you can open the door with zoning, and you have control over the infrastructure, but that's really as far as the planning board's powers go. So you're trying to tell us we're not designers. <laughs> okay, and actually before we, Chris, could you remind us of the limitations on the number of curb cuts on University Drive between Amity Street and Route 9? There was um, the ability to have six curb cuts between Amity Street and Route 9. And then um, Barry Roberts came and asked the town meeting 
to allow another curb cut, which allowed him to build, um, what is it, 70 University Drive. And so that was allowed by town meeting. So anyone who wanted to have another curb cut on University Drive would have to go to town council to get approval for that. And the limitation was established by whom for what purpose? The limitation was established by the town because um, the town wanted University Drive to be a kind of a fast moving road. They wanted to have, you know, slow moving traffic on that access road, which is on the west side of the road. And they didn't want to have a lot of um, people coming in and out of driveways along University Drive that would slow the traffic down. Now, we have a different approach to traffic at this time, so we might want to so slow the, town the traffic does, down. So the town, through the council, can change that uh, approach to the town, to the to this road. And yes. So, great. I, I, so I it's was possible concerned it was a have, private no. easement or something no. that was not something we could appeal. It was something the town imposed on, on itself, itself, and now it can <laughs> not take it away. Oh, in its yeah. wisdom. Yes. <laughs> okay, Janet. So I have a question for you, Doug, which is you were talking at the last meeting about, you know, University Drive extended onto the UMass campus and, you know, maybe doing a sort of visioning together with them. And so I didn't, I feel like here's a list of things I didn't do this week. I didn't go down there and look there. I've been, I walked there and I've gone to games there. And I know that it in State College, there's a lot of, um, alumni housing that's been built around their um, probably perhaps more successful football team. But, um, but you know, there is, there seems to be a lot of open land. It seems flat. I don't see, I think there are some wetlands further down in the woods maybe, but what was your idea about that? Like, would that be more student housing, grad student housing, faculty housing? Cause it is pretty open land. Um, I think, the main thing I was referring to was when the university, when the U3 report was done, which was the sort of where could privatized housing happen on, uh, this was the report that was done sort of 2013, 14, jointly by the, with a U3 was the name of the consultant that was hired by the, jointly by the town and the university. And they came up with three different potential places for a whole bunch of housing, one of which is this parcel on UMass's land that is now housing, the, the big development that is open, is just opened. The second location was along North Pleasant Street, uh, kind of where what the, the parcel that for a while was called the Gateway Parcel. Um, and the third location was at the north end of University Drive, where there's a bunch of parking lots beyond uh, kind of opposite southwest uh, on the west side of University Drive. So, you know, those were the three things that that consultant came up with. Um, you know, I, I think I, in the, in the meeting, last in-person meeting, or maybe two in-person meetings ago, I had mentioned University Drive as a place for fruitful conversation between the town and the university simply because it's a continuous road that goes from control by the land, by the by the town, into control by the university. And you know, I was it was one of two, the other being North Pleasant Street, two zones where there was real connection. Um and so that you know, if the two parties worked together, you'd be more likely to have a unified st street. Uh, whereas some other parts of the UMass campus, if they build a dormitory somewhere there, it doesn't really abut town land. So there's no opportunity for the town to work together with them on that. Likewise, you know, if the town did something that didn't abut UMass, then there's no point in talking to UMass too much about it because they're not impacted or they're not related to it. So, I mean, what what would UMass do on University Drive between those parking lots and Amity Street? I don't I don't know. Um, so, um, and and so I mean I'm 
and end of that end of that end of that answer. Uh, but I wanted to come back to something. Maybe it was Karen. Somebody mentioned the the elderly housing and the healthcare that's at the corner of University Drive. I think that is kind of a little. That's our little medical center. I mean, except for Valley. What is it? Valley Medical that's on Belchertown Road, but this is uh, as much as of a concentration of healthcare as we have, and I assume that part of the reason it's there is that it's right at Route Nine, like it's a straight shot to Cooley Dickinson. So whoever whoever brought that up, I totally agree that even though the boundary of this uh, area that staff has drawn encompasses those facilities. I think we ought to treat that corner probably differently from uh, the rest of it, just because we don't want to lose and push that function away. Um, at least I assume we don't. I mean, if we, if we want to have some healthcare facilities in town rather than in Hadley, um, this is where they are. This is, seems like maybe we could allow them to build larger medical facilities on that corner. And maybe, you know, I'd love it if Valley Medical moved closer to where I am. <laughs> so anyway, um, okay. So I am just want to do a time check here. It is 11 after seven. Uh, we've typically tried to do these meetings as two hour meetings, starting a little bit earlier at six o'clock than our usual meetings so that we could let staff go home and have dinner uh, sooner. And so I want to be, cognizant of that so you know it it, it does uh, i mean i guess if i had to just sort of off the top of my head summarize what we're hearing um it seems like there's a probably a predominance of enthusiasm to look at university drive and maybe uh east amherst village i think there's probably prudent uh concern about the north pleasant street area um, just in terms of the politics of town. Um, so, you know, I think, I guess I would ask Chris and Nate, um, you know, given, given the constraints of your workload and your staff, is it reasonable for us to ask you to come back with any sort of developed vision or the beginnings of a suggestion for conversation with uh, the board. Um, I will tell you, uh, you know, earlier this year, I had kind of noodled, you know, ideas for one area in town, and I could certainly modify those noodles to uh, apply to some of these, you know, because you think about something in one area, there's stuff you learn that you can apply to other areas. Um, so, you know, board members could come back with, here's what I propose for one of these areas. Um, you know, it just seems to me that, you know, it's all the facets of zoning. It's the dimensional, the setbacks, the, the, uh, the heights. Um, it's what type of use would be appropriate, you know, in terms of the sort of categories that we have now. Hopefully those are, uh, you know, uh, there's enough there and you don't have to invent a new category. So Chris, why don't we start with you and Nate and just say, what do you think you could do? And then the question that I'll, we don't need answers from the board. It's just, we've heard what Chris and Nate can probably generate. If you want there to be more that shows up as we continue this conversation, maybe, you know, you need to think about doing something and proposing it. So uh, let's, let me let Chris answer, and then Fred, I see your hand. There. Okay. Um, I don't want to lose something that Jesse brought out, which is we need statistics uh, and looking at the big picture. And I'm aware that generating these statistics probably involves a lot of time looking through uh, information and so on. I, I'm not even exactly sure how it would be done, but it strikes me it's probably the sort of thing that um, requires a lot of 
effort by that could be done by people who aren't particularly exactly trained in and uh you know i would volunteer some time of you know some boots on the ground doing this and and so forth if uh chris if you if you could maybe consider that and yes i i i understand you are definitely limited in terms of professional time chris so I think um, what I'm hearing from Fred and Jesse is that they want data on neighborhoods and they want to know how many of the houses are rented and how many are owner occupied and non-owner occupied and how many people live in the houses that are there. So what we're talking about here with these three areas are not neighborhoods. They're areas of town that are already developed and there are houses there, but the houses are not the preponderance of the use. So I think if we're going to focus on these areas, University Drive and East Amherst Village Center, my sense is that to do that, we don't need as much data as Jesse was suggesting earlier. We would need that if we were going to focus on the RG zoning district or RN or something like that. Is that is that correct? Jesse's shaking his head yes mm -hmm. fred fred would like everything so what we've decided though may i just continue, yep, continue. On? um so i think there would need to be a more of a commitment on the part of the planning board to continue this conversation past october 25th if we were going to really pursue a lot of different ideas we're we've we've promised the town that we will have three in-person meetings to deal with housing issues. Now, we can decide that we're going to have more than that. We actually set aside one Wednesday at the end of November as the fourth Wednesday. But if you want to continue this conversation and really make a proposal and do something, we're probably going to have to go beyond the end of November. And if we're talking about going into next year, maybe we can start you know, gathering data. But if we're going to focus on these particular areas, you know, I, I think you have to make a choice. What do you want to do? What do you want to do first? How much time do you want to spend on it? And what do you want to do? We can support you. As I said, we're not going to be, you know, we can't spend all of our time on this, but we can support you. Right. Okay. Johanna. Thank you. Um, been doing a lot of listening tonight. I am not interested in sending the staff on a wild goose chase until, unless this board has like bona fide interest in actually then working with those recommendations. And my thinking is change doesn't happen in giant leaps. Usually it happens incrementally. So if we think the path of least resistance to add a lot of housing in town is by exploring University Drive. I'm a little bit inclined to keep it discreet, focused on that, we, and, and see if we can actually move that ball forward and get that to completion, and then move on to the next chunk. So like Chris, it, I would love to have you and Nate spend that time, but I think unless there's actual buy-in and like working on that chunk in a bona fide way, I wouldn't want you to spend the time in it. So I don't know if it's like, I don't know if we can do straw, a straw poll of like, yes, do that. Or actually no, spend your time on something else. But uh, Jesse, I see your hand, but Karen, I see her hand too. I, I agree with Joanna and I for one am ready to go and commit myself to working further to really look at University Drive. I mean, we've been asked to do something uh, and, and find the best place in town where we can move ahead. And I think we're all kind of excited about this possibility. And, and as Fred said, we have to look at um, the down parts as well as the other parts. Um, so yes, let's, let's go for continuing this University Drive uh, exploration and concentrating on that 
in the meantime, in our other planning, so we we deal with all the other things which are equally important. As Jesse said, we have to uh, mm -hmm. zero in on on some rules uh, how to protect the town from from going under with this pressure from students. Okay, so that's one. That's two members who are supportive of focusing on University Drive. Uh, Jesse, I see your hand. Thanks. Yeah, I I don't disagree. I think it's a great idea to start with University Drive, focus there. Um, the, the comment is it doesn't alleviate the urgency many of mm -hmm. us are expressing about the other issues. Mm -hmm. and that that should be a quick second. That, mm -hmm. that, hopefully, I will tell you, I I at one one point when I had a Sunday afternoon free, I I went. I, I had a neighborhood I was thinking about and how much was interested to know how much of it was rental housing. And I, one by one, went through the town uh, property cards to see, is this owner occupied or not? Because it says on the pro on the property cards, I will tell you that I knew through the entire, I don't know, two hours that I spent, I knew there had to be a better way to do it. I just didn't know what that was or if I had access to it. Yes, I was thinking the same thing in my neighborhood. You could just count who leaves their recycle bins out and those are rentals. Yeah, very straightforward. yeah it's pretty straightforward. <laughs> or go around on Sunday morning and see where the red beer cups are and you know what's going on. I would add that in the summer, what street has like nobody on it, which is, you know, a lot of streets, you know, between College Street and Mass Ave. I agree that we should focus on University Drive. And I, I, I wonder if we could create a quick like two people to work on that with Chris and Nate. And then with ideas going back and forth or something, because I, you know, we don't have a zoning subcommittee, but it's nice to have a small group of people working on stuff and coming back to the larger group. I mean, I don't know if it's this moment to do a subgroup, but I think it makes sense. Um, it might make sense for in terms of assistance too. So remind me, I, I think there was one meeting back in the spring or summer that I missed. And, but when I watched the, video, I thought I heard maybe you, Chris, say that if the board charges a subset of it to go work on something and come back to the board, that when that subset meets, it is considered subject to open meeting law. Therefore, the public is invited, minutes have to happen, agenda has to be posted, and all of those encumbrances, I, I, there's got to be a more politic word than that, uh, are, are in effect. And for that reason, you know, we don't want to require the town staff to do new m more minutes and have more postings and advertisements, and all that stuff. And did I hear that right? I mean, it seemed like you did it hear it right, and maybe Nate can uh, add to this. But my understanding is, if two members of a board want to work on something, and they're not designated as a subcommittee, then they don't have to keep minutes and post meetings. If so, it's more of a if it, they if they volunteer, if they volunteer, rather than be charged. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> so I believe that is the case. Um, Nate, is that your understanding too? <clears throat> yeah, I, I found some decisions, um, determinations from the state, and that's considered a sub quorum. And you know, anyways, it's right. So it's not official subcommittee. So that's that's my understanding as well. Okay, Fred, uh, Chris, can you hand oh, Fred the microphone? Yeah, my uh, having just uh, sub subjected myself to the open meeting law training um i believe the the uh you're you're good at three or fewer uh provided you're not deliberating uh and so it has to be something that's informal but if three members of the planning board that's where as soon as you get to four it becomes a core then it, then it becomes a deliberation um but three or fewer uh, and as long as they're not a named subcommittee or something, that, that that's where the line is drawn, I believe. Okay. 
Okay. Chris, is there something else you want to say? No, I was just going to say that, well, there is something else I wanted to say. I think Nate and I could um, carve out some time to work with members of the planning board who were interested in working on this, three or fewer. So okay. you you need to you know volunteer right. yourselves and not be nominated and not be voted on. Right. We, we could do that. And, and we'll be working with Rob Mara on this project too. Okay. You also raised the question of whether we wanted to continue these fifth, whatever, fourth or fifth, whatever, end of month me extra meetings uh, longer. What's your sense of the board's workload in the next couple of months? And I guess the, re you know, it, because we've, we originally set these up as an extra meeting each month, but if our workload is reasonably light, we could have these kinds of conversations during a regular meeting and not have to create another meeting with another set of minutes that, you know, you struggle to keep up with us on. Um, so we don't want to, we want to go into that with our eyes open if we are going that way. Chris. So right now the planning boards, um, heavy lifting is really recommending, making re recommendations to the Zoning Board of Appeals on the Shootsbury Road Solar Project and the two comprehensive permit projects that are coming along and possibly one other solar project. But um, you don't have a lot of um, applications that are directed towards the planning board right now, unless I'm missing something and we could ask Nate. The Jones Library is a big one, yeah. That was supposed to come in for October 18th. It hasn't come in yet. So that's probably something you're going to be tackling in November. Right now you have Shootsbury Road Solar coming along on October 4th. Um, so far, nothing on October 18th. And then there's a first meeting in November, which I can't remember the date of that. Maybe Pam could re remember that. But um, whatever the first Wednesday in November is, which might be November 1st. I think it is November 1st. So you could come back to this conversation on October 18th, if that would be Just do it. something do it that you want to do. Do people feel like doing it in person is beneficial rather than doing having trying to have this kind of conversation as a Zoom? OK, so maybe we could think about trying to do the October 18th meeting in person starting at 6 instead of 630. And that way we could continue this conversation and limit ourselves to two meetings that month and we all win. Jesse. Can I ask that we get this other piece on the conversation agenda at some point soon too? The, the neighborhood piece. The Yes, and ways we can strategize around yeah. regulation, so I whatever think, word we want to use for right. student housing in neighborhoods. So a big I, I'm hoping that a big contr contribution to that conversation is going to be Bruce, because he's the one that's been calling around to all a bunch of other college town planning offices and um, finding out what they what they've tried, what they've worked, what's worked, what didn't work, you know, all that stuff. And so I don't know what his progress is while he's. He's overseas, but uh, you know he's been plugging away at it at least. And when he put these boards together, you know he'd talked to five or six of the towns of the however many ten he had on his list, and it seemed like he was starting to learn something that might be informative. Okay, so before we, I'm thinking maybe we've talked about this topic to not enough tonight. Um, and before we go to item two on our agenda, I want to call on the public to see if there are any public comments that people want to make. Um, I don't have the stopwatch that Pam usually runs, but I have my regular watch. Um, so three minutes or less. Are there any pub members of the public who would like to speak? So we will start with the people in the room. Uh, and I see one hand. Please give us your name. And your your uh, street address, assuming you still live in Amherst, and uh, go ahead. Thank you. I'm Pam Rooney, 42 Cottage Street. I'm actually speaking as the liaison to the town council now. And the fact that I, I wanted to 
inform this group that the Community Resources Committee, which has been talking about rental registration and nuisance bylaw for the last year and a half, um, has asked of town staff for a list of rental units in town, that being every unit that is not owner occupied. And that request has been made. We got an updated um, data sheet not too long ago, but it was actually still only those units that had requested a permit. And so we know that that is not conclusive, that is not comprehensive. Um, Rob Morrow would be a good place to start with this. And if any assistance could be given to him, it was literally a secondary task if someone had time to work on it. And we know they didn't have time to work on it. So that's a really good place to start. I truly would like that information. The CRC would like that information. And I think it helps us uh, globally understand better the housing situation in Amherst. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Councillor Rooney. Uh, the second hand from the public is a person named Lily Bruce. If Pam, if you could bring her over and let her speak. Welcome, Lily. You have three minutes to comment on our discussion about changing zoning uh, for housing in town. Hi, um, so yeah, my name is Lily Bruce. I am a student at UMass Amherst. Um, so I'm on the Student Government Association and my role is to, um, I'm the Secretary of External Affairs. So my role is to work directly with the town council. So just being here and listening to all this conversation, I wanted to give my perspective from a student. So students don't move off campus because it's cheaper. We move off campus because the university does not guarantee housing past our first year being on campus. And um, just, I live in Puffton Village now. So just being off campus, um, it is a lot more expensive being off campus. Um, a majority of off-campus students also do have meal plans. So that also adds to it. Um, I just wanted to, um, I don't know, sort of uh, just discuss about the how changing the zoning so that students aren't allowed to live on certain streets in Amherst. I think that is going to be a very, very difficult thing to do because students, we don't have, um, we're not guaranteed housing on campus. So we have to go off campus and then limiting our ability to live in certain places. Um, we won't have anywhere to live unless more places are built. And I think the university tried to correct that by building um, the field stove building that is on Mass Ave in Lincoln. Um, however, that building, the rents are, I know it's not anything to do with the town, but the rents for that one, it's um, about $1,500 a month for a four bedroom apartment per person. One of my um, friends lives there. So I've been there. They also are not at capacity because those buildings aren't done yet. So I just have um, a lot of concerns about whether building these new buildings are going to help fix the problem with housing with UMass. And I think the discussion is really needed with UMass administrators to talk about this and come up with a plan to fix this just because um, there are more students coming to the university every year as well. And um, also would the students not being able to live, I have a question, just a student is saying students aren't being able to live on certain streets. Um, would that include graduate students as well? Because I know a lot of the times graduate students aren't around the same age as undergraduate students. So I just wanted to clarify if that was just for graduate students or undergraduate students as well. Thank you. Thank you, Lily. Um, I will venture a, at least my answer to your question. Uh, I think many of the members of the town who object to students in their neighborhood, uh, the objections are coming from undergraduates who tend to be more boisterous and uh, higher, louder, <laughs> um, and that graduate students uh, probably are more quiet and and less less of a problem. So uh, I see Jesse and Janet who have their hands up. Maybe you guys have a different perspective on that. Just to comment, I don't think there was any idea that of eliminating students from certain streets. I think the idea was more about limiting the number and really the number of new rentals that 
are increasingly a sort of houses being Convergence. predatory purchased Con for rentals. Conversion. Conversions from single family to student rentals. So uh, I haven't heard any conversation about no, this street is not for students, not like that. Well, when you when 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 we've had this conversation and we use the word students and we're talking about do we want to try to reduce the density of students in neighborhoods? Have you had any uh, sense of whether you're th really thinking about undergraduates or graduate students? Uh, honestly, no. Um, I feel like it's just about the, the density of non-owner occupied rentals. In okay. Neighborhoods. So that might be another way to talk about it without actually using right. the word yes. students. Correct. Yeah, owner occupancy versus non. And that's already a a thing in our in our zoning bylaw. Um, so students are not a protected class under federal or Massachusetts law. And so, um, but we have laws against age discrimination. And so if you say undergraduates, that could be considered age discrimination, although there are undergrads who are obviously older. So that's kind of a hairy line. Um, you can discriminate in a positive way by limiting, you know, places to 55 plus for no reason that I understand, but the Supreme Court said it was okay. Um, so that's kind of a hairy line or a fuzzy line there that you're starting to walk towards age discrimination if you're saying grad versus undergrad. Um, I have a completely unrelated issue. Um, are we having a meeting on the 25th with the UMass people? That be Would that be three meetings then in October? Yeah, we have October 25th is a plan. And I had forgotten that when I said earlier, gee, if we had this conversation on the 18th, we could d dispense with the last one. So my mistake. Thank you for po pointing that out. Chris, do you want to say something? And then I'm hoping we move on to these questions uh, so we can fill out the meeting. Yeah, I wasn't assuming that you made a mistake. I was assuming that you wanted to add a meeting on October 18th to talk about this same topic and then have the meeting on October 25th as well. So, okay. So, okay. That's something that you could consider whether you want to have three meetings. So right now, when are our meetings scheduled? October 4th and October 18th. And tentatively and 20th, October 25th, because you've invited 25th. 25th Tony. 25th was the, the extra FTC. one. Right. And so um, I said to you that there's nothing currently scheduled in for terms the 18th. of applications for the 18th. And then you said, well, or maybe I said yeah. that we could use that as um, a time to discuss this right. more. But maybe so, what we should do is eliminate the one on the 18th and just have October 4th and October 25th. I mean, we, up to that's you. another option, yep. which I guess we... Our next meeting's October the next 4th, meeting and is we're going to have that Wednesday, meeting. Wednesday, so you could think about that. <laughs> By Zoom. So in the meantime, in the next week, why don't you and I figure out what we want to do? Okay. <laughs> and if anybody has any input on that, yeah. please, please let Just me Just email know. Chris. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Good. Uh, Karen, you have another comment, or are you ready to talk um, about the next I, item? I have, a, I have a message that uh, Jennifer Taub has her hand up. And she oh, yeah. yeah. Good. Thank you, Karen. And I, I did want to mention to Lily, I think uh, it's so good that she spoke up and maybe we can team together to really um, work together with the university so that they also really understand they have to accelerate their own building of student housing. Okay. Thank you, Karen. Okay. Jennifer Taub, I see you're and now, and why don't we move, Jen move Jennifer over? Name and address, please, and okay. whether you're speaking as a counselor or a private citizen. Thank you. Um, yes, I'm Jennifer Taub at 259 Lincoln Avenue, and I am speaking um, as a private citizen, <laughs> as a resident. Um, so I wanted, um, I guess, to respond to a couple of things. I mean, first, I think starting off looking at University Drive is a terrific suggestion. I think that would be um, I think a lot of people would be uh, in agreement that that would be a, a great place to start. Um, I did want to say, <clears throat> respond to, I, I wanted to say this in response actually to the last in-person meeting the planning board had, and then also to respond to Lily that, you know, whether if we were ever to look at what they call in like State College Pennsylvania minimum distance requirements, um, it is definitely not in any way to say no 
students or, or anybody is allowed on a particular street, it's saying there would be a certain number of feet between what, like in State College, they call student houses. And what that actually does, it's not a concern with, you know, in any way with renters, the number of renters versus homeowners on a street, that if every house can't be a, rented to students priced by the bedroom, that actually leaves some houses, you know, if there's a, a student house, a house that can't be rented to students, and then a student house, so the one in the middle, if the property owner wants to rent it, it would have to be priced so that families or, you know, young workers, so that non-student households could afford to live there. And that, it seems like, you know, it's hard to come up with how do we ensure that some of the rental housing is priced so that, again, non-student households can afford to live there. And that, you know, is one strategy that we might look at. You know, I don't know that it's the only one, but it's definitely not intended to in any way be anti-renter. It's actually to make more rental housing available to more different kinds of households in town and, and certainly not to restrict have streets where there couldn't be any of a certain um, kind, kind of renter. So I did want to respond to that. And I just, from my personal experience, living two blocks from campus, um, that, that there is, I'm just going to say it, there, there is a big difference that I see between, um, you know, on the whole, I don't, graduate students, there's really very little difference, I think, with, um, you know, non-student households. And I think it's not, I have two student houses 50 feet from my backyard. We meet with them at the beginning of every year. It really, there's very good relations. Um, and well, actually, Jesse lives on the street. <laughs> but um, it's, there have been two houses um, and only two for many years. And I think that we have a really good balance there. I think if many more were to go that way that we wouldn't have the balance and that would change the way life is on the street. So I think it's very much a matter of balance. That's all, thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Okay, I don't see any more hands. Oh, Fred, one more. We, we do wanna to get to these questions before we're done. Yeah, just a brief comment on the concept of uh, the, the house between the two uh, being uh, with the rent at uh, some rate that uh, would be conducive to a certain uh, income level. Uh, that seems to me to be a form of rent control. And rent control in Massachusetts is contrary to law. So I think that is a non-starter in Massachusetts. Thank you, Fred. Okay, so the time now is 7.43. Hopefully we can get through this not too long after eight o'clock, but uh, the second item on our agenda this evening was to talk about questions that we might put to the two representatives from UMass when they come to our planning board meeting on October 25th. And Karen, I think you put together this list that uh, was included in our packet. Um, so board members, I hope you've had a chance to look at this and think about these questions and whether you agree with them, you support these questions, whether there's more questions you'd like to ask, uh, keeping in mind that I I hope we don't have much more than an hour, I would guess, with, with the two of them because um, we may have other things on our to, to discuss that night. Um, so we don't want to have a huge number of questions. Uh, Chris, I see your hand. I just wanted to suggest that along with these questions, you also talk to them about your intent to look at University Drive as a place where more housing could go, and then they can bring that idea back to the university and see if there can be a conversation that started based on that. Okay. Okay. Um, so question four, the current enrollment, is that kind of moot based on this kind of, uh, stuff that's published online or you want the most up-to-date questions, Janet? Okay. All right. So we still want that. 
Um, so, okay, so maybe just going through these questions. So who are the planners at UMass that are involved with planning what housing gets built and where? Um, so I, I this was one question that um, I kind of questioned <laughs> um, it, it, because it was more about who are the players and and I it gets toward whether whether the university would would ever allow the planning board to talk to anybody other than the designated people that generally talk to the town. And so my question in for this question would be more, could we replace this question with what are the questions you want to ask the planners who are involved with planning what housing happens? And, and well, let's ask those questions of whoever it is at the university that's going to assemble the answers that are delivered by the people that usually talk to the town. So uh, are there questions you want to ask those planners? Janet. Um, I, I missed this. Um, I mean, I wasn't here at the last meeting, but I'm so is there a problem with I mean to to just if someone on the planning board just called the planning department and said, oh, who's working on the new housing, you know, planning for dorms and you know whatever, like that's something I would do just because of my personality. And so would that be a problem to the university? I've, I've talked to the off-campus housing person many years ago, and we had a big brainstorm about, you know, working with the senior center and maybe have helping get students get housed with seniors. And and so is that is that a problem to do that kind of communication? I mean, because it's not like an official proclamation. It's just sort of like calling somebody up and saying, hey, what do you know? You know, are you planning new units or is... Is that, I mean, you work there. So, I mean, I am, I am not, I'm not supposed to talk for UMass. That's part of the way I keep my two hats separate. So, so I don't, uh, so I'm, I'm not really eager to answer that question. My experience is that the university has people in university relations who do the communication with town and with the public and with the press and, that all goes through them. So, Chris, and then Jesse. The Donahue Institute is also a good source of information, and what information they have is available to the public. So, people in the planning department often get information from the okay. Donahue Institute. So, you could try that. Okay, Jesse. Thanks. <clears throat> so, when I looked over your questions, Karen, I, I agree this would be great information to get i feel like the second three they're just facts they're just numbers and i think yes we should ask for that because as a planning board that's useful information for us to know be mm -hmm. aware of the actual numbers mm -hmm. that they can provide for us most accurately <clears throat> i think the first three i i'm guessing they wouldn't want to answer those directly frankly and i think it's summed up as a different question, which could be, what are UMass's concrete plans to address the housing issue? Because that affects what we decide also. So I think if we phrase it like that, I don't know if we'll get any concrete answers, but I think that's the conversation starter mm -hmm. which really taps into all this. Because, yeah, like you guys just said, I don't think they're going to say, oh, yeah, here are the three people, here are their numbers, call them when you want. Like That conversation, that information flow won't happen, we might guess. Why do you guess that? I'm wondering whether you could elaborate on your sense of that. Uh, I've had some informal conversations with people, and it was it basically your response exactly the same, which is you're not speaking for UMass in this capacity, and I think there are designated people in the administration who will provide information, and others won't. Right. So, and and I agree with part of what came up last meeting here was that there should not be ten different lines of communication between the board and UMass. It should be more of an official conversation route. Yes, we can try and gather information, but whether that's then going to be accurate, Janet, I'm not sure. Right? Okay. Um, I don't know which of you went first. Johanna. Thanks, Doug. Um, I agree that the first three questions 
about like who are the people is probably not that appropriate, but I'd like to build out some of these other ones. So I'm interested in current enrollment at UMass this semester and the breakdown. Um, if they have the 2022 and 2023 data, that would be great to complete this table. And if they have projections, that would be great too. I don't know if they have projections through 2030, but that would be awesome. Um, and then I love the question of just what number of beds are in the pipeline and getting those same projections per year on campus. Um, and then I don't know how to ask this diplomatically and I don't know whether like there's the assumption that the university ought to be able to house every single student that they bring to our community. But I'd love to hear like, how do they think about it? So uh, maybe we can figure out how to package and ask that question. Can I add something? Sure, response. So before I was on planning board recently, I had an exchange with a friend of mine who, and I basically asked that question. And the response I got was, well, look, we're building 800 beds. There's no problem. So I don't know what the official response would be, meaning, hey, UMass, do you think it's your responsibility to house all the students? My sense is the answer is not really. Well, there is a, but I mean, we can ask. You can, yeah, we can ask that question. There is a counter question, which the town and we could consider, which is, do we want UMass to house all the students that are at UMass? I mean, is if we did that, or, or you know, if, if UMass did that, would all, would the housing prices in Amherst crash? And then everybody who's frustrated that they can't find housing could find housing. And there'd be a whole lot of new people that came to town who are not students. Would that just all be perfect? I mean, maybe, maybe it would be. Can it? That would be like 16,000 new beds, but um, from what, I, what I'm reading. So this isn't, I mean, I think the I think the honing in on these questions is really good, especially since we want answers and it's good to get them ahead of time. I was struck when I was listening to the international college, you know, whatever that thing is that how many of these college towns said, you know, we have there were the planners in the town, college town who said we have really great relations with the university and we're working together on these solutions. And sometimes it was a student housing district. You know, in a certain part of town, and you know, I know they did zoning changes to facilitate that. But I just thought, like, I heard that, and I was like, "That's what we want," you know. And so I think that, um, you know, we—that—that's what I want to see. And I don't know. I think we could lead the way in creating that more, and you know, like, not more work for Chris. But I think, you know, that I, I just heard that sentence, and I was like, "That's what we need. That's what we want," you know. So maybe a question would be, what? can how can the, the the town and the university work better together on on addressing housing demand in Amherst and I mean you know what was it six or seven years ago there was that university town of Amherst collaborative um, which went on for two or three years and then sort of seemed like it just fizzled out um, that was one effort by the previous chancellor and there's a new chancellor and maybe he sees things differently. So maybe he's got a different model, but that might be a good question. Jesse. Maybe that question could be phrased as we, the planning board would like to work with UMass on some joint projects for more housing. Who is the right person to do that with or to, to try and get that engagement? So what does a joint housing project look like? I mean, so what you were just builds, raising builds its things. So where, where developers where, build right, their but things. Where land abuts. So uh -huh. strategic development together. Like you're talking about the the north end of University Drive and the south end of UMass's property. Right. Have a conversation with the appropriate. So it's not actually a, a project. Right. It's not like a, a joint, building itself. It's, it's saying this is the area we want to develop. You know, try and get university buy-in and. Right. It wouldn't be commitment, but 
for them to think about that as well. Right. So should Olympia Drive be part of the conversation too? I mean, that came up early tonight as a area that somebody, I forget, Janet or maybe Karen had identified as an area of why can't there be more buildings there? Um, one thing I remember about that area that might be worth reminding everybody that Kyle Wilson said when he was here, look, you know, when, when he came to the board to talk about his latest project, he said that there were a number of parcels off of Olympia Drive that by by right, as the, a property owner in that subdivision, he had the right for his people to park or recreate on those parcels. So part of the part of the limitations or the way that whole thing is set up you know, if if UMass built a lot of buildings on all the rest of the parcels in University Drive, then Kyle's tenants wouldn't have anywhere to park. So he might object to that, and he'd have a legal right to do that. So that's just uh, something to keep in mind as we talk about Olympia Drive. Janet? So you're saying a question about their plans or ideas about University Drive? I mean, Olympia Drive, sorry. Yeah, maybe what what would be opportunity, what opportunities are there for more housing in on Olympia Drive? Uh, I, Nate, I'll call on you. You haven't talked in a while, and then we'll go to Karin. Actually, Karin's hand was up first, so I don't mind waiting. Okay, Karin? Um, yeah, just briefly. Uh, thank you, Doug. I think that we should include Olympia Drive in our conversation. And part of the reason why I had these questions is um, I realized we don't want we we haven't got unlimited time, and I hope that Nancy and Tony come prepared with these just facts that would help us get clarity. And uh, in asking for um, who are the planners, that's actually my my idea was not you know tell us all just who are they. It would be nice to know how university goes about that. How how do they come up with their numbers? Just a little bit of more information uh, is what I wanted in that respect. Okay, so maybe the questions are more about what is what is the process? How do the different parts of the university contribute to eventual decisions about housing? Exactly. Exactly. Okay. All right, Chris. Uh, Chris, is it is it true we're likely that you're going to probably recapitulate these these questions and then send them to Tony and Nancy before they show up, so they'll they can pre prepare. Okay, Johanna. Thank you. In addition to what is their process for moving forward housing, I would love to just get an overview of their planning department. I don't know enough about who, you know, how many people are involved? What is the scope of their planning? You know, so a, a little bit of a 10,000 foot perspective on how they think about building things on campus and then getting into the process for housing, adding beds. I can, I can share one memory from when I was on the UTAC subcommittee, housing subcommittee, one of our early meetings of that subcommittee, we hope, was hosted at UMass. And I think I and a couple other people presented on the UMass master plan at the time. So it was at the offices of the planning, campus planning group. So that's a precedent we might consider. I just wanted uh, to mention that the master plan is on the university website, if people yes, want to look at the that. the campus master plan is on the campus planning master uh, uh, website. Uh, Nate, you had your hand up. We're back to you. Sure, thanks. Yeah, I, I like the idea of asking, you know, so what are their future projections? You know, I think it'd be important to ask, you know, do they plan any faculty or other housing, not just for undergraduate students? And then with their public-private partnerships, you know, you know, do they have, did they have any control over the rent that's being charged? I mean, that is the most expensive housing in Western Mass. 
I think another important question would be, are they aware or do they acknowledge the impact that they have on the surrounding towns in terms of the housing market? Just, you know, what, what are their thoughts on, you know, because they always say that they house 60, 61% on campus and it's more than most state universities, which is true. Um, it's also, there's a difference in scale between the surrounding communities and the university, say, compared to like Boulder, right? So, right, I've been attending these International Town Gown Association webinars too. And the, the you know, this, the communities that speak are, granted, they're, they're university campuses, but the surrounding communities are 100,000 plus people. So it's not, um, you know, Boulder is is a bit is a city uh, compared to Amherst. So was in, you know we looked at like Tulsa and all these other places. It's like the scale of the surrounding communities are much is much bigger than Amherst. So I'd just be curious to ask that question. You know what do they do they look at this kind of regional impact in terms of their housing? Um, That's it, Nate. Yeah, I mean, I think everyone else has asked the, all the other questions, right? Like, what's their plan for the next 20 or 30 years? What, you know, what's kind of, what's the decision-making process? I feel like it's just the beginning of a conversation. You know, uh, Tony and Nancy have come to the Housing Trust probably three times in the last five years, and they're very willing to do it. And I think that they do provide data. I think that's important. It, it changes, right, how they categorize students. It's like, there's University Without Walls, there's commuting students, there's you know, so I think the the data point is is a fluctuating thing. I think generally the question would be, okay, what is their trend, right? What is it? Are they going to maintain the sixty percent if they grow by five thousand in the next ten years? If that's their plan, well, then we can kind of extrapolate the data. I mean, I don't want to get hung up on like the minutia. It's more about okay, what's the general trend? And you know, the demographic cliff to me is is hocus pocus because I think UMass as a system will funnel kids to Amherst, and you know maybe. Um, you know, maybe other campuses would not fare as well, but I think as the flagship campus, the university, um, you know, in Amherst will will be okay. You know, I think other smaller schools or campuses may not, but I, I think that uh, in Amherst that the demographic cliff won't be as dramatically felt as, you know, people are, are saying. And so, you know, I mean, we could ask that, you know, what do they really consider with that, you know, demographic cliff that is mentioned? And Yeah, that um, seems like a reasonable question. But I, I, yeah, I mean, I think everything people have been saying is a great start to a conversation. And then it's just like, okay, how do we tease out or try to get some more concrete information? Um, and just one last thing, University Drive. I mean, if people want to research like what they want it to look like and just send Chris and myself images or ideas, I mean, this will help with the downtown design standards as well. But, you know, what is a boulevard? What are the design standards you want to see? And we can bring that to the downtown consultants, but I feel like those are things that, you know, if you're doing research, I mean, I was just online, like APA has some nice kind of tutorials, but if anyone has any, anything, just throw it our way, because I think it's a, it would be a missed opportunity if we don't both plan long-term and then have some of these shorter term strategies or ideas, because, um, you know, this conversation happened, you know, 50 years ago and with the SCOG report in 73. And then in the early eighties, there was a report, you know, college towns in Massachusetts and the impact of student housing. And it's the same conversation 40 years later. And so I feel like we kind of time we have some action. <laughs> well, I'm sure Karen has some photos of Berlin and Paris that she could send <laughs> or what, a bullet, what, what university drive should be. <laughs> uh, I'd like that. <laughs> Okay. All right. So I just want to say to people, we're after eight o'clock, so think about winding down, but Janet, you're next. Um, I have Bruce's question, which is um, the number of students housed in, um, off in outside of Amherst, if they have numbers on, you know, who's in, how many people in Sunderland or Hadley? Yeah. And how many? Um, and then I was thinking of the, asking any plans for on-campus housing for families, graduate students, and faculty. Great. Chris is furiously writing down our additional questions. Jesse. Maybe one suggestion on how to ask that could be, can you help us capture that data rather than just saying, what's what are the numbers? Maybe there'll be a little more engagement that way. <laughs> I remember when we did, when, when I was on that UTAC subcommittee, that was a question that nobody could answer because 
the university had a lot of, you know, if they had the home address for the for the for the undergraduates mostly, and there was no point in the registration process that was required to give a local address. Yes, but I think my idea is we ask, can you help us gather the data? They have mechanisms where we could gather the data. Send an anonymous poll to students. Where do you live? What town do you live? Some stuff like that is possible if they wanted to. That's what I'm saying. Okay. Okay. So everybody's good for tonight. I'm not seeing any hands. Oh, Nate, you've got your hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry. I think to Jesse's point, I mean, I like that. Like if, for instance, there's missing data sets, is there ways to capture that, whether it's for future enrollment? So, you know, it's kind of like um, the town's moving to an online permitting software and staff's been discussing what are the, you know, what are data fields we'd like to collect that it's hard to capture now. And so, you know, if maybe since COVID, UMass has changed some of their, some of their reporting, but I, I mean, I, you know, if we're, if we're curious about some of this and they're, you know, maybe they are too, like, okay, where does their faculty live? And so is there a way that they can move forward with capturing that? And so, you know, it could be a one-time survey or poll, but maybe could they build that into, um, you know, some of their forms or something so that it just becomes a reporting mechanism um, that, you know, could be shared as needed. And so, uh, Janet, your question, you weren't here at the last meeting, but Paul Bachman said, you know, they have weekly meetings, I think, with some UMass, and then there's, you know, monthly, I mean, there's pretty consistent meetings. And my thought might be that um, moving forward, maybe, you know, there's a chance for the planning board to submit questions through the town manager's office that could be asked of UMass, right? So I think the one point of contact is is important. And so there's, you know, other ways to to reach out to them. But if the planning board has specific questions, I think there's probably ways to get that to UMass and try to get answers and not necessarily have someone come to a planning board meeting. We could try to get questions through those kind of conversations with the town manager. But I like the idea of missing data. Just, you know, if if the, if we think it's important, is there a way to start collecting it, formalize that a little bit? Okay. Do, you're, you're reminding me of that report that you three put together, which it had some statistics that I think it was like only 25% of UMass staff lived in Amherst. And it was part, and it was mostly the higher paid tenured professors, probably because it was an expensive town to live in. So somehow that information was collected as part of uh, that study. So I suppose it could be updated. Um, do you, do, do Chris or Nate, do you have that rep the kind of final U3 report? From I think we have a link. We have a link, but I think the UTAC page, if you search it online, I think it's still uh, an active. It's still website. active. Okay. Yeah. Because it it seemed like that might be something that was useful for, uh, for the planning board to see, because, you know, that was kind of a milestone in town gown collaboration on housing. It was probably kind of the last big one. And the, the, the big mass app project that's just opening now is really a pretty direct outgrowth of that effort. So, you know, this isn't a bad time to be saying, well, what is, what's the next 10 years look like? Uh, Jesse, I'm going to call on you and then Janet. Just has... quickly, anecdotally, I bet it's way lower than that in conversations I've had with staff I know about who lives oh, the in percentage. Amherst, percentage living in Amherst. And UMass must have that information if they want to share it because they send paychecks to everybody. Right. right? So, right. So quickly, Doug, yeah, it looks like the UMass, the UTAC website is still there. And then there's a related okay. documents tab. I, I actually thought that was a great, I thought that was a great uh, process and dialogue too. And I, I thought that was a great way to have, you know, the so town maybe, gown At least, Chris, if you could send a link to that to the board, maybe in, in lieu of, you know, sending us specific documents, but I don't know what's on that and how many documents there are, but it'd probably be good to point people to or uh, to the the last, you know, the summary, summary document. Janet? Um, I Adding the 800 students to the 2021 numbers, I have UMass's housing 45% of its students. I think when they say that 60%, they're talking about undergrads usually. 
And so I'm they have like seven thousand grad students. So I I think we should like that should be a clarity number. So it's not a question. I'm just saying, I was just thinking when we're talking about how many students, because UMass always says we do 60% of their students, but they're only talking undergrads and there's 7,000 extra students. So I think the number looks like 45% to me. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So, so Chris just said she would put together the questions and review them with me before she sends them to Nancy and Tony. Okay. All right. I'm not seeing any hand, any more hands and everybody's quiet and hungry. So maybe time now is 810. Unless there is objection, why don't we adjourn? So are we good? All right, we'll see you, everybody by Zoom on, on October 4th. Thank you all for coming. Good night. Have a good night, Karen. <laughs>